Hopefully all of our names are written down in glory. I know mine is. Amen. We are in 2 Corinthians this morning. As Jay mentioned earlier, he's been in Isaiah. It's a really good series he's been going through. I highly recommend watching it if you haven't seen, catching up right on fbcdexter.com if you haven't seen any, or you missed a few. And I am going to start in a new series in 2 Corinthians. Um, with the holidays coming up, those can be kind of broken because we have Advent and Thanksgiving and such, but it's still going to be hopefully a fun, a fun series to go through. But we're going to be going through uh, the first seven verses this morning, concentrating on verses 3 to 7, and that's page 1208. If you're using a, a hymn or a pew Bible this morning, you're um, page 1208 there. Before we get started, too, I just wanted to say real quick a, th a thank you to, we have a number of, of young people helping us out in our technology. Isaac, my two kids upstairs, Isaac and Zeke, are help doing the sound and Nolan down here doing the live stream. So I think it's pretty cool, too, that we have um, our young ones getting involved and uh, doing our technology, because without them, I don't think we would be able to do a live stream or have me here and running the, the word. So thank you guys. You're awesome. All right, starting, starting at verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance and of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you and we praise you this morning. Thank you for who you are. And Lord, we just read that you are the God of all comfort, and we praise you for that. And right now, I pray that you would come minister to us and show us this to be true. And you are our comforter in all times, especially troubled times. We pray this in your name. Amen. So on Saturday the, the 18th, so a week ago yesterday, I was tasked with leading a portion of prayer at a concert of prayer, and I was tasked with leading the portion on Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving to God. And there was a handful of people there, and we were able to go through a list that we each made of things, what to thank God for. I had everybody write stuff down as, as I was speaking. And one of the points that I made sure to bring out that morning was that we are to give thanks in all circumstances that we are in, even the most difficult circumstances that we are going through, right? Why? Because we worship a God of comfort in all circumstances. And this might seem hard at the time, but it is a practice we all need to really adhere to. Our hope and our strength in all circumstances is always found in God, who is ever unchanging then so our hope and strength should also be unchanging. Right? Paul, Paul urged those who are suffering and with troubled hearts, he urged them to find their strength in God, to find their comfort in God. Paul knew that God bestows comfort, for he too had been the recipient of a lot of afflictions in his time, a lot of hardships. Right? He was beaten to a point where people thought he was dead. And they threw him out, yet Paul was still comforted. He was jailed multiple times, shipwrecked, yet he was still comforted. And so for that, we can give God thanks. And this morning, as I mentioned, I'm starting a series on 2 Corinthians. In these first four verses we will be looking at, we will see the blessing we have in our Heavenly Father who comforts us all in all our troubles. So first, 
the God of all comforts. We're going to look at. So after the first introduction here, the first two verses, Paul starts off this letter with by praising God for, for comforting and encouraging him. Paul praises God because of who God is, not because of his difficult circumstances, right? We need to realize that, right? Paul's circumstances are changing, but he's not praising God for those circumstances. He's saying, God, you're unchanging, and I praise you for the comfort I still have. Because Paul's hardships do not stop him from giving God his due praise, and they, that shouldn't stop us either. Paul ascribed to God three names when praising him. The first is God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is our mediator with the Father. Jesus, right, he humbled himself in his incarnation and placed himself in dependency upon the Father. That's amazing when you think about it. Jesus, who is God, submitted to his authority still and became man so that he can bless us and comfort us for all eternity. He then addressed God as the father of compassion. Compassion here goes out in the seeing of another's distress. Some translations use the word mercy, right? So God's mercies include deliverance from the world, from sin, from Satan, and give us a fellowship with the Spirit in truth and in light. And the third title Paul gives is the God of all comfort. That's a title we're going to concentrate on this morning. And the word used for comfort here has the idea of standing beside a, a person to encourage them while they are under testing. Right? The same word is used by Jesus to describe the Holy Spirit when he's telling the disciples, I'm going to send a comforter to you. The idea is that God is the divine supplier of all consolation to his people. Everything. He is the God of all comfort. Not only by delivering us from evil or by ordering our external circumstances, but by chiefly by the inward influence of his presence on the mind and heart, which gets rid of all our doubt and our fears. And when we let that happen, we let God rid that from us, it then fills us with joy and peace in any circumstance. It's found in who he is. Paul, he found genuine comfort in God. That's why I love reading Paul's epistles, because he says where he's writing from. And he is writing from places of distress and hardship, but he still finds comfort in God. And you will too. As you go through difficult times, as you go through real life storms, as you go through immense challenges, you will find, even as Paul found out, God will give you comfort. You will discover that he is the father of mercy who will comfort you. Is there a problem that you have that's too big to handle alone or grief too great to bear? Let the God of all comfort comfort you. Let him lead you into his presence and provide you with that comfort. Verse 4 tells us that we have been graced with comfort so that we might comfort others. Listen to what it says. Who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So the God of all comfort comforts us in our time of hardship, right? In trouble. But I want you to notice two things here. First is that God comforts us in all our trouble, all of it, not just some trouble, not just some big things or little things, nothing too big for God to comfort us. He comforts us in all of our trouble. The second thing I want you to notice is the purpose of it. It is introduced by the phrase, so that. The reason why God comforts is so that we can comfort anybody else in trouble. Receiving God's comfort in our troubles enables us to comfort others. Isn't that amazing? Being comforted by God 
qualifies you to minister comfort to others no matter what their afflictions might be. The comfort of God is, is, not, is not intended to stop, right, when you receive it, but it's intended to then extend out from you and go to others. God's comforting prepares and equips us for the God-like ministry of comforting and encouraging others within whatever affliction, whatever suffering they might be in. This is the a principle of the Christian life in all areas. We receive, we're blessed, we're given to by God, not to hold on to it and store it, but that we can pass it on. We're blessed so that we can be a blessing. Right? We're not looking to build up and all this and show off to everybody, look how good I'm living my life. Nothing's going wrong. I'm great. I feel great. No, go out to others and share that with others as well. This passage explains to us that the degree we can comfort others is the degree we have been comforted ourselves. So it's only when we have experienced God's faithfulness firsthand that we can minister to others the assurance that God will be faithful to them. And I could attest to that. There are things that if I didn't go through my life, I couldn't empathize as easily with others. I couldn't as easily give comfort to others if I myself didn't go through hardships, right? Maybe it's why we say that experience is the best teacher. We learn the most from what affects us personally. In a Christian life, we may acquire some wisdom in times of prosperity, maybe. But oh, the deeper lessons we can learn in the school of tribulation and the school of sorrow. If you have received comfort from the Lord in troubled times, God wants you to share with others the lessons you've learned. God does not comfort us to make us comfortable. He comforts us to make us comforters to others. A life of ease is often stagnant, right? There's not much growth. But it is those who suffer much for righteousness, who experience much comfort of the Holy Spirit, that are deepened as individuals and learn how to live a fuller and more meaningful life. Suffering enriches life experiences and builds inner resources. There isn't a theologian that I have read that I deeply respect that hasn't gone through some deep suffering. In the underground church in China, they don't allow a pastor to become a pastor until he has been jailed at least one time for sharing Christ with others. They know. If you're not willing to pay the price yourself, how are you going to minister to others? And Jesus told his troubled disciples that after his departure, he would send the Holy Spirit as a comforter. Why would he do that? Well, <laughs> Jesus knew we're going to have some troubled times. If you're going to have troubled times, you're going to need someone to comfort you. The peace that Jesus gives to us comes through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if we want to bring comfort to others, we must have an intimate relationship with the Lord and experience his comfort. Then by our practical deeds and by our quiet presence, we can show those who are hurting that we care. Did you hear that? By our practical deeds and by our quiet presence. People who are hurting don't need a lecture. People who are hurting don't need to be pounded and say, well, if you just follow Jesus, show them Christ's love. That will speak well more volumes than anything you can say.
Many think that when God comforts us, our troubles should, should go away. But if that were always so, people would turn to God only out of desire to be relieved of pain and not out of love for him. God's not our genie, but he loves us. So we must understand that being comforted can also mean receiving strength, receiving encouragement, and hope to deal with our troubles. The more we suffer, the more comfort God gives us. If you're feeling overwhelmed, allowing God, allow God to comfort you. Remember that every trial you endure will help you comfort other people who are suffering similar troubles. And that's a great thought to keep on your mind as you're going through the suffering. Say, God, I pray that you will use this experience. Grow me and use it so that I may bless somebody else, even as I'm going through it. So secondly, the results of suffering. Verse 5 give us, gives us the reason why suffering equips the saints to give out God's comfort. It says, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Romans 8, 17 tells us we are each fellow sufferers with Christ. If you know Christ's story, he suffered quite a bit. The sufferings of Christ are those afflictions we experience as we do Christ's ministry. These are sufferings for righteousness and maturing sake. As we suffer, Christ suffers with us since we are united with him. In Acts chapter 9, verses 4 to 5, Christ asked Paul why he was persecuting him. Right? So this implies that Christ suffers along with the persecuted Christians. Those who are suffering, Christ is right there. The result of suffering with Christ is that Christ overflows in comfort to us. No matter how great the sufferings a Christian is called to endure, those sufferings are always outmatched by the comfort which God bestows upon them. Always outmatched. We can never have troubles, we can never have hardships that are beyond God's comfort. As the problems increase, so does God's comfort. As Christ's sufferings was a prelude to glory, so also those who share in his glory must first share in his sufferings. If you don't experience Christ, your suffering can lead to coldness. It can lead to hardness or despair instead of consolation. This makes the great difference between the sorrow of believers and those of unbelievers. Alienation from Christ does not secure freedom from suffering, but it does cut us off from his comfort. Everybody in the world is going to experience suffering. Wouldn't you rather have a comforter to carry you through it? When you have a cup and you fill it and it starts overflowing, whatever spills over the edge of that cup is whatever you put into it, right? That's, that's a natural process that I understand. Whatever you put into it, that's what overflows. But with the Christian life, it's different. There's a supernatural process that happens here. Because when suffering is poured into a Christian life, the Christian will begin to overflow. However, what spills over is different from what goes in. Suffering goes in, but comfort comes out. That is a miracle. And it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit does that happen. When we experience tribulation for being a Christian and suffering is poured into our lives, God will transform it by his supernatural grace and power and will overflow encouragement into the lives of others. When trouble flows in, look to God for his overflowing comfort. First to us, then through us to others. I've experienced that firsthand myself as well. Where I've gone through suffering and people 
have watched how I've endured that and has comforted others. I didn't like it at the time, but looking back, I see how God used that suffering to bless others. And if we're truly his children, if we're truly his vessels for him to do what he wants with, then let it be. Verse 6 expands the lesson of verse 4 concerning the purpose of suffering. It says, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. Those who experience affliction can now truly encourage, comfort, and urge those they are ministering in a way that results in, in greater deliverance from the old and into the new. So the church of Corinth knew that the cost Paul had paid and should be aware that they're going to suffer also. Suffering helps us, makes us better ministers of God. And it helps transform us into who God wants us to be. Right? It's easy for us to be happy when everything is going smoothly, when everything is going great, Right? But it takes great faith to rejoice in the Lord in times of darkness and tribulation. Yet the kind of attitude, that kind of attitude glorifies God. Consecrated believers, knowing that he is working out his all-wise purpose in their lives, patiently waiting for God's eternal blessings that flow out of life's storms. Last night I was speaking to my mother and she told me about people who often will say, oh, you're not healed because you don't have enough faith. Oh, you did something wrong in your life, so maybe that's why you're sick, and then maybe that's why you've had that ailment. Then she told me it was that somebody actually had the nerve to say that to Johnny Erickson Tata, that she was still in her state of being a quadriplegic because she didn't have enough faith. I would say it's just the opposite. That God's glory is shining all the more through her in her crippled state because she's being comforted and not wallowing, saying, oh, woe is me. She's saying all that she can do, and look at how many people she has ministered to because of that. How many of you guys have heard of William Moon? William Moon is somebody who helped blind people read what the Braille, the modern-day Braille system is based off of. Well, he was considered one of the most brilliant minds of his time. And when he was at the height of his mental powers, his future looked promising. But then strate- tragedy struck. He became blind. At first, he couldn't accept his trial and exclaimed bitterly, what are all my abilities worth now that I am shut up here in my room and the whole world is shut out? Slowly he began to realize that God had a wise purpose in allowing him to be afflicted. Because his own eyes were sightless, he began to develop a unique system of reproducing the alphabet to assist others in a similar condition. And they already had a rail type system then, but it was very hard to learn, very hard to people might be able to still use it. And soon, the system he came up with, it was adapted to fit the languages of many different countries, including remote areas in the world. More than four million blind people were thus enabled to read the Bible. They found that the kind of embossed type he used was easy to learn, even though it required more space in the page than the Braille system that was later modeled after it. William Moon had become a missionary in an unusual way and had brought encouragement and salvation to many. He could rejoice because out of his tragedy had come a great triumph. Right? He didn't quit what he was doing. He didn't wallow in his misery. I couldn't imagine losing my sight. But here he invented a way for people to read. Blind people, four million people, and I read the Bible. Probably many more since. 
So now I must ask you, how do you react to hardship? How do you react to trials? How do you react to tragedy when it comes to your life? Do you stay in, in self-pity? Or do you see them as opportunities for God to use you all the more? God desires to use our times of trouble to refine us and to redirect our goals. He uses them to give us a, a paradigm shift on life from looking at hardships that might usually cause us to wallow in self-pity to allowing it to grow us in our dependence on our Heavenly Father and use it to help and comfort others. God uses suffering to cause us to need the ministry of others and grow more dependent on fellowship and the Lord to bring about his good pleasure in our lives. Life may hold bitter experiences for us, but God can use them to help us understand the suffering that others go through and equip us to minister to their needs. A life in tune with God has notes of sadness as well as gladness, dark and rainy seasons as well as bright and sunny ones. Hope spurring on our Christian Hope for our Christian growth is grounded in the merging of divine encouragement that suffering brings, as verse 7 states. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. Hope carries the idea of, of waiting in expectation, confidently and with patience. Despite their shortcomings of love and loyalty, Paul regards the Corinthian church with an unshakable hope. And Paul and his companions suffered greatly for bringing comfort and salvation to the Corinthians. But just as God comforted Paul, God would also comfort the Corinthian believers when they suffered for their faith. He would give them the strength to endure. In a little while, we're going to be singing the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Many of us know that hymn, and I'm sure many of us know that story. But it was a pretty famous hymn now written by Horatio Spafford. And Horatio was a successful lawyer in Chicago who had invested heavily in real estate along the shores of Lake Michigan. He was a prosperous man, a devoted husband, and a devout Christian. But in 1870, a series of events began to turn his life inside out. First, Horatio and Anna's only son, Horatio Jr., he died of scarlet fever at the tender age of four. The following year, while still mourning the loss of their son, every single one of Horatio's investments were lost in the great Chicago fire. A few years later, when they decided to take a much-needed vacation, he sent his four daughters and wife ahead on a boat to England. And so on the way there, the boat struck another boat, and it sank in 12 minutes. And Horatio received the devastating news that the Villa de Havre had collided with the Loch Urn on an iron-hulled vessel. All and it took 226 lives when that boat sank, including Horatio's four daughters. And when she arrived in England, she sent him a telegram. I said, saved alone, what shall I do? As soon as possible, Horatio boarded a ship to join his grieving wife. En route to England, the captain called for him to the bridge and said, a careful reckoning has been made, and I believe we are now passing the area where the boat sunk. And according to his daughter born after this tragedy, that's where her father wrote, it is well with my soul. And he wrote this words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, 
it is well, it is well with my soul. Horatio and Anna's faith in God never faltered. He later wrote to Anna's half-sister, said, on Thursday last, we passed over the spot where she went down in mid-ocean, the waters three miles deep. But I do not think of my dear ones there. They are safe, dear lambs. Naturally, Anna was utterly devastated but she testified that in her grief and despair, she had been conscious of a soft voice speaking to her. You were saved for a purpose. She remembers something a friend has once said, it's easy to be grateful and good when you have so much, but take care that you are not a fair weather friend to God. Now these words penned so long ago by Horatio in, these, in this hymn, have brought hope and comfort to hundreds of thousands of people and still give us hope and comfort today. When affliction strikes us, how do we react? Are we embittered? Or do we trustfully appropriate God's sustaining grace? Do we prayfully encourage those around us by our spirit enabled cheerfulness or courage, our courage and our confidence in God. As we rely on the Lord, he can help us to turn our pain into praise. When we're up to the neck in hot water, be like a teapot and start singing. In closing, in the service of Christ, there will be disappointments but there should not be despair. There will be conflicts, but there should not be doubt. There will be afflictions, but never without comfort. May we each always look to the God of comfort in all circumstances. May we, with the psalmist, declare, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker heavens and earth. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, dear Father God, Lord, we praise you for who you are, knowing that you are the God of all comfort in all circumstances, Lord. Lord, knowing that each one of us here have faced currently faces and will face hard times. Lord, I pray that you will give us comfort in those times as you have so promised. But Lord, I also pray that you, we won't stay there, but that we will move out of that and that we will look to comfort others, Lord, that we will see these painful and hard times as opportunities to share your love with others. And when people ask, how can you be at peace? How can you be comforted? That we could use those opportunities to share the good news. And we could say to them, only by your power, only by your grace, are we comforted, Lord. Lord, we cling to that hope. And let us have the hope as the Corinthian church had, Lord knowing that you comfort us. And because of that, let us never be worried about tomorrow. Let us never live in anxiousness and fear, knowing that you are in control. Let us find our hope and comfort in that. And we pray all this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.